We'd like to welcome you guys all back to the University of Idaho and University of Wyoming Extension Sheep and Goat webinar series. Um, today, Carmen and I are going to continue where we left off last week, which was um, the lambs and kids receiving some colostrum and getting up and going, and we're going to move forward from there. So last week we talked a lot about making sure that those lambs and kids are getting up and going and getting that colostrum in them. Um, that should happen in the first 12 hours, uh, but within that first 24 hour period, that's really critical, keeping that colostrum, making sure they're getting enough to eat, that type of thing. So in that first day or two of their life, they need to be um, sort of obviously baby, they are babies after all. <laughs> so um, some of the things that I do to help get them going a little bit is any of the lambs, regardless of their status, as far as um, whether or not they're up and going and doing well, or maybe they're a little down, whichever the case, I always give them some probiotics to jumpstart that gut and get it going. And so there's a couple of different ones that you can get um, and that you can find that at your local feed store. Uh, locally here in Salmon, I can get this Dervet lamb and kid paste or the Probios, which is also now labeled for sheep and goats. The other thing that you can do if you've got some lambs or kids that are just kind of slow getting started, maybe they just seem a little bit down, uh, you can give them a nutrient rich drench. Um, the Nutra drench is a great one for that. It's um, got the propylene glycol, which is a really high energy easy to absorb um, nutrient that helps them just get that energy going. And vitamin B is also another good one to um, promote energy. The other thing, if you're in an area where you're having any issues with selenium or vitamin E deficiencies, this is the time really early on to give them that BOC shot. The other thing that you wanna do is to dip their navels uh, you can use a 7% 7, 7 iodine or betadine, um, which I've got shown here on the slide. Um, the, the best way to make sure you get really good coverage is to use one of these um, dipping tools, or you can even fill up a um, the, op the open part of, this, of a syringe or whatever it may be that you can get really good coverage, do a full dip. You can also spray with a squirt bottle but it's not as effective as if you dip because you're getting much better coverage that way. So um, that'll help keep any bacteria from crawling up into those navels and causing a, a bacterial infection. The other thing that a lot of people wanna do is weigh those lambs and kids early on so that they can monitor progress of growth. And um, this is a great way to have good records on your animals as you move forward, but also making sure that they're actually growing, which is crucial. If they're not getting enough milk and they're not able to grow, then you know that there's a problem. So you can monitor any sort of weight gain on a daily basis is an indicator of them being, a, being able to get enough milk. So if you're somebody who lambs in your lambs or kids in jugs, this first 24 to 48 hours is when they would be in those jugs and they'd be bonding with their mothers. And this is when you'd wanna do the other processing just because of how handy it is to grab them while they're in those jugs. But if you're not lambing and kidding in jugs, the other processing, which we'll talk about as we go forward, can happen later on as well. Carmen. Okay, so I'll cover a little bit on grafting. So um, grafting is obviously this non-forcible acceptance uh, dependent on time since the delivery and age of lamb and kid. So when a ewe or a doe has a kid and maybe they um, lose that, that baby animal and there's an orphan or another rejected lamb or kid that you want to graft on to that mother, um, these are just a couple different methods that we'll go over that, um, depending on your situation, will hopefully be successful so that that lamb or kid can actually be dam raised and not have to be um, bottle raised. So that's kind of the overall goal of grafting, right? Um, 
So the first thing is you kind of have to get the dam to accept that lamb or kid, both mentally as well as physically. So usually if they have lost, um, so if you had one that had a stillborn or um, had a, a lamb or kid die within those first, you know, 24 hours after birth, um, usually you can take that, that fetus or that um, dead lamb or kid and kind of make the new lamb or kids smell like the old one and that's kind of that 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 mental and physical deceiving of the dam I guess I would say you want her to believe that the new one is actually the old one and so a couple of different ways to do that is to wet the orphan or the rejected lamb um, so you can put those in water or salt molasses to kind of get rid of their old smell and then you're going to put the new smell on them, essentially. So you can um, put the two um, kids together, so rubbing their rears together, and then present them to the dam at the same time, especially if they have twins. This is a really um, handy thing to do. I've done it a lot with twins, is I'll take the twin that they already know is theirs and take the afterbirth off of that one and put it on to the, re the, the reject of someone else, the one I'm trying to graft on so that they smell like the other twin. Um, so you can rub those fetal fluids, use the water bag and put it on top of the, um, the new kid, the graft kid. Um, just anything that's gonna give that new kid the smell of the old kid. Oh, I'm sorry if you hear my dog. Um, and so you're trying to get them to smell like, like the kid that they want, essentially. You can also put um, something on them that encourages the licking of that dam onto the new kids. So um, what I like to do is I'll rub the um, like milk on them and I'll rub some of the afterbirth on them. And then she starts to lick that off because then they're wet, kind of like what she would expect them to be after they're born. In some cases, if you take the pelt off of the deceased slammer kid, kind of skim them and then tie it onto the new kid. Um, that's also been seen to be very successful. We've done that with our uh, beef calves and usually that will do the trick. Um, some other things is you can mask the dam's ability to smell. And so I've seen this done a lot with like vanilla or even um, lavender. If you put the lavender on the nose of the female and then the bum, uh, like, you know, the rear end of the kid, and then she smells the lavender on her nose, and then the rear end of that kid, that can sometimes help with that bonding, um, bonding reaction between the two of them as well. Can you go to the next slide, Melinda? Um, so to achieve this, sometimes you have to catch the ewer dough, put them in a stanchion so that it's easier for that new kid um, to get up and drink without being pushed around. Um, and she's also not trying to run away from them. So you're kind of forcing her to be next to them. You can use a head catch or halter to do that and then attempt the feeding. You know, sometimes you have to help that kid learn how to nurse from the new um, female. And so you usually just kind of put um, the tea into their mouth and maybe squirt some milk in there. And then they, they will usually catch on sometimes if they already have trouble um, nursing or if you had them on a bottle from the get-go that can be kind of a foreign thing to them so you might have to get up and do that for them um, a few times and then it's a pretty typical response especially those first few hours that the the female might be kicking um, so the best thing there is obviously to tie the feet either to like a board or the side of the pin so she can't um, kick or time together so that they kind of learn. It's kind of like a, um, what am I trying to think of with horses? But you would um, make it so if they kick, they have a negative response. <laughs> and then obviously patients, sometimes it can take days for them to accept that new lamb or kid. But um, if you have the time and the patience, it's usually worth it for um, that lamb or kid to be dam raised instead of having to um, raise them on a bottle yourself. So that brings us to orphan lambs, which I'm not going to cover in too much detail today because next week we have a full webinar scheduled to talk specifically about orphan lambs and kids. Um, but we wanted to 
touch on a couple of things that would help you in the meantime. Um, the first thing, at least for, for Carmen and I, it's, it's better to let the dam raise them if they will. Even if they don't have the milk, if they love those kids, they'll take care of them and you can go out and feed them on a regular schedule. Um, like we mentioned in the first couple of days, that's really often every couple of hours. But after a day or two, you can teach the lambs and kids how to get onto a milk bar or a bucket. So this is just a rudimentary photo, or, or it's not a rudimentary photo, it's a rudimentary bucket that um, I put together for my lambs. It's got a nipple out each side. Um, and you can teach them how to get on that bucket, pour milk in uh, twice a day, and they can suckle at their own um, pace, whatever they want. And the only thing that's really a struggle here, you can see I've got the um, saran wrap over the top of mine in this picture. Uh, that was because I was getting some weather. Um, it, but the main thing is to make sure that the milk is thawed out when it's really cold. Or of course, if it's warm, you don't want the milk to spoil. So you've got to come up with ways to maintain the temperature of the milk. Um, and there's a lot of options out there for that. Um, whether it's putting a, a frozen water bottle in the milk um, or figuring out a way to put the milk in a cooler and have it siphon out to the nipples or whatever it is that you need to do to keep that milk at temperature. Um, and the main thing that leads to being able to successfully transition lambs and kids onto a bucket or a milk bar is keep them in a smaller pen until they're really familiar with where it's coming from. And then you can turn them back out um, in the, in a, with the group and they'll still find the milk as needed once they're used to where it's coming from. Okay, so um, I'll just talk a little bit about how else to handle those rejected lambs and kids. Um, and this is kind of, if you are gonna have to bottle raise them or raise them on some type of replacer, kind of the target and maybe market that you have for them. So if you're planning your kidding and lambing dates so that you have more growth and time for you know that later season, um, typically these kids will be able to catch up because sometimes bottle raising can, it, it doesn't necessarily stunt them, but they don't grow as well as one that is dam raised. And so if you're able to um, kind of market them in the right way so that they're still able to be a good, um, a good product, a good lamb and kit, or excuse me, um, lamb and goat product, then that would be your end all goal. So marketing those um, to kid or earlier in the season is obviously beneficial so that you can reach some of those niche markets with um, at the right size so that they could be used for some of those um, different holidays. So Cinco de Mayo, um, summer, summer barbecue goats, things like that, so that they are still able to be used um, in the best possible way. You also need to identify a good milk bar and bucket strategy that works for you to decrease your labor. Um, if you only have a few, sometimes it's okay to just have bottles and go out three or four times a day and bottle feed them. Um, if you're gonna, if you have a larger flock or herd and you plan on having you know, 10 or 12 bottles, obviously are gonna be a lot of work for that number of goats. Um, and so figuring out a milk bar strategy that works to you, just kind of like what Melinda was mentioning. And then obviously start starting those on creep within the first one to two weeks of age is really going to help them get a jump start so that they can reach those markets um, later in the year. Um, and it's, if done correctly with having a little bit of um, like grass hay or even first cutting off alpha hay in those first couple of weeks their rumens should be able to develop fast enough that they can definitely digest um, a creep feed within the first one to two weeks of age. And, and kids that are on their mom, um, they're gonna also be eating hay. And if you're uh, grain feeding your um, dams, they'll also be eating some of that whenever you start that. So it's not something to be too scared of. Um, just definitely watch and make sure that they don't scour on a high quality feed um, and, and keep them drinking the milk as you transition them so it's not such a change um, in their diet. And that's also another good point that I think we'll get to here in a minute um, with using a CDT vaccination to help prevent any 
um, overeating disease. Okay, I think we'll pause for a couple of questions, Carmen. The first one is with milk buckets, how do you keep the milk warm? I thought it needed to be 100 to 110 degrees. So it does, um, when you first start them on a bottle, it does need to be fed at 100 to 104 degrees. But as time goes on, their, um, their stomachs can handle the colder milk. Um, and so if you, if you have them on the warm milk, especially when they're very small, they'll work, that is preferred. But then as you transition them to a bucket feeder, they can also digest colder milk um, within probably after they're two weeks old. It's just something that you need to be mindful of because if it's cold, it, you don't want them to drink cold milk and get cold. Um, I, so if they're kind of a smaller animal um, and at risk of not being able to regulate their own temperature, you can't give them cold milk. Um, but the milk will warm once it hits their stomach and they're still able to digest it. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, I agree. Once they're able to get up and eat on their own and their mother's taking care of them or whatever it is, um, you can switch to a cooler milk supplement and their bodies will adjust fine. Um, the next question is, would it be wise to choose to bottle feed a kid so that I can get the most milk from the mother? I assume that's a dairy goat of some yeah. kind. People certainly do that. It's just like um, bottle or bucket raising calves. It's the same principle. Um, and, and a lot of dairy goat operators will do that. Um, it's, a, it's your management decision. Um, but yeah, it's certainly, certainly applicable. And I think um, if done properly, they can be raised on a bottle and grow just fine. Okay. Is there any chance of grafting a rejected kid back onto its mom at approximately 12 hours old? I have not had success with that. Um, if we have one rejecting a kid, usually they're pretty aggressive towards that kid, which is why they have rejected it. And so for the safety of the kid, I won't try and graft them back on. Um, so I have not had success. Sometimes they do that. I've seen it a lot with triplets. They'll kind of pick off the weak one, or I've seen it interestingly enough with, um, if they have like triplets and two are bucks and there's one doling or two doings and one buck, sometimes they'll pick off the one that's not the same sex. And so when they do that, I don't really, it's not worth um, my patience and time to try and get them to take it back. So I'll usually take it off and bottle feed or graft it onto another dough um, that, that is more accepting. Okay, um, this one says my dozer are due to kid in March and I'm wondering if she has three kids, if I will need to bottle feed one or if she'll be able to raise all three and be healthy. That depends on the dough. Um, if she has enough milk to feed all three, they will all be fine. We have been pretty successful in that. If we notice that the kids are suffering, if they're not getting enough milk and they look kind of hungry a lot, or if we notice her laying down a lot so that they can't nurse, we take that as a sign that she doesn't have enough milk to feed them all. And they're either nursing too often and it's painful for her because they're always chewing on her um, or that they're not growing enough. So at that point, we will typically take one off and try and supplement it with a bottle, um, but then leave them out there just so that a couple times a day they're getting, you know, a little extra milk. So they're not nursing her as much. Um, but I've had some that have raised triplets and they're all like 50 pounds when we wean them. So they didn't have any trouble. So it really depends on the production of the dough, if she can handle raising triplets. Yeah, and that's a great time to use that method of measuring their weights every day. If, if they're gaining weight, they're gonna be fine. If they're not gaining weight, you probably wanna choose one to pull off of her to make yeah. sure that they're getting what they need. Um, the next question is, if, we, if you are transitioning from bottles to a bucket feeder, is there a potential for overeating? Um, Carmen, if you don't mind, I'll take this one. Um, yes, but usually when I'm transitioning to a bucket, 
it's when the lambs have gotten the hang of eating off of a bottle and it's still pretty early on. And at that point, you do need to still go out at each feeding time and show the lambs where to find the milk and stand there with them and make sure that they're suckling. And if you do it early enough and they're used to eating every couple of hours at that point, then you have a much lower chance of them having any issues with overeating. But you can monitor that as the in the first day or two that you're trying to transition them. If they're standing there eating and eating and eating, you may have to work a little harder and have more patience with them to transition them. Um, the next question is a two week old Nigerian dwarf buckling. Is it better to move to a milk bucket or keep on a bottle? Um, I would say if you only have one, to me, it is actually simpler to keep them on a bottle because then you can monitor that, that feeding for just the one. Um, but if you need to, for your own management purposes, he would probably be fine on a bucket. But again, with Mel what Melinda just um, explained, keep that in mind. Okay, how do I tell how many kids my doe is due to have? The best way is ultrasound, but um, that is the, you have to be ultrasounding them between 30 and 45 days after they were bred. Um, so if they're past that point, you will probably know when they kid. Um, we've done later ultrasounds and they're not as, they are not as effective at telling us actually how many are gonna be in there. Um, but if you want to know, between 30 and 45 days after breeding is the best time. Many kids are bottle fed for a CAE prevention program. Uh, yes, I. that is a good point, um, especially with dairy goats. Many kids will be pulled and fed pasteurized um, milk to prevent any transmission of CAE from the dam to the um, offspring. And that's another point with um, herd testing for diseases like that to help prevent that, um, that contamination as well. I noticed you said if a doe is laying down, you would take one off. Would it be more beneficial to just give each kid one bottle a day to supplement? Yes, I've done both. Um, we've supplemented as well as removing a kid. Sometimes it's hard to get them to take a bottle consistently after dam nursing or nursing the dam. Um, so that's why we will just take a bottle out and see if we can get a couple of them to nurse off of it to give her a break. Okay, the last question we have right now is, can you raise goats and sheep on fresh cow's milk? The answer is yes, but you're gonna risk a lot of digestive upset and it's much better for the kids and lambs to be raised on a specific lamb and kid milk replacer because sheep and goats have a much higher fat content in their milk. And so there's just not enough in that cow's milk to really do a good job with lambs and kids as they're growing. Okay. Would you agree with that, Carmen? Yes, I would. Yep, that's what I would have said, so you're good. <laughs> I guess I missed a couple of questions in the chat. How likely is it or how often that lambs will get rejected? Um, it does happen occasionally. And certainly with sheep, especially, and if you're not in the dairy side of things, um, if you have ewes that are rejecting lambs, I would recommend getting rid of them and not keeping any ewe lambs from them because it's a mothering instinct and that is somewhat heritable. So um, that's what I would recommend with that. And oftentimes with ewes, three lambs is a pretty good load and most of the time people don't ask their ewes to raise more than two, so. Okay. And I'll there. just, I think the question on the milking machine is the automated milk replacer feeders. Um, and those are good. I know some people that use those and they're very, um, they really like them. And so I think if your operation can afford one of those um, and you have enough kids that it spreads the cost, um, it would be a good tool to have. Okay. So 
at this point, you know, everybody should be eating and doing pretty well. And there are going to be some possible complications that arise that you want to keep a close eye on in the first month, especially. Um, but it can, of course, go on for the first two or three months in lambs. Um, you want to really watch them close, make sure that they are not acting weak or sluggish. If there are any signs of illness or, or sluggishness, you want to take those physiological measures that we've talked about a couple of times, um, a rectal temperature, a heart rate, et cetera. If they're having any indication that they're ill, now's the time to um, find out what's going on, maybe call your vet depending on your level of um, comfort with identifying disease. Um, I'm gonna talk about three things that are pretty common in kids and lambs as they go through their first month of life. Um, the first one, and it happens more than we would ever like to believe, and that is starvation, which leads to hypothermia. And that will be one of your leading causes of death in small ruminant babies. And so this is when you really wanna keep a close eye on how they're acting and behaving. Make sure that when they're um, nursing off of their mother that their belly looks full after they get done and they should be gaining daily. So we'll hit that over and over because the main way to tell if they're not getting enough to eat is if they're not gaining weight. They should gain something every single day. Another thing that happens a lot is scours or diarrhea. And so this is just a gut upset and sometimes it's bacterial and sometimes it's um, kind of an uh, overeating or, or an issue that is just making their tummies upset. Um, most of the time, as with any diarrheal infection in any species, it's going to cause dehydration. And so the primary thing that you can do right off the bat is to provide electrolytes. Um, this is a time though that you want to work with your vet because there are a million different things that can cause scours in lambs and kids and you want to treat according to what it is that you have. And there are some that are really nasty um, that you don't want to spread to the rest of your flock or herd. And lastly, pneumonia is one that can happen. Um, so watch for any sort of coughing and difficulty breathing. They'll get sluggish. They'll probably have a temperature. Um, and the main thing there is <clears throat> one of the main causes of pneumonia is, is a dirty pen. So especially if you're lambing in jugs or um, if they're in a confined area, the ammonia that comes off of the urine and the feces can cause pneumonia. So if you keep a nice clean pen and do some uh, disinfecting and sterilizing periodically and provide new clean bedding, um, that's gonna help a lot to decrease that. But there are also some bacterial strains that cause pneumonia that you may end up wanting to vaccinate for, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Did we have any questions here, Carmen? So, well, these go back to a little bit more of the questions before. Um, So I'll, I think they just asked about the milk replacer brand. Do you have any, what is the one that you use, Melinda? Yeah, I would say that you want it to be a animal protein based, so um, not a plant-based one. You also want it to be specific to kids and lambs. And usually you can, the best thing probably is to, is to have your local feed store um, they usually have it. If they don't have it, ask them to order it in. And um, you can also buy it online, but I would I would make sure that it's a whey based rather than a soy based. Okay, good. Um, so I'll answer these two really quick, and then we'll move on. Um, the question is: um, Using a Nigerian dwarf for dairy goats once they kid, do they produce enough milk for both? Can you? Um, use them. I think the question is, can you use them for dairy milking as well as nursing the kids? Um, and I do, we do that with our dairy goats. Um, I know some other people that do. It depends on the goat and how much milk they produce, if they can nurse the kid and still have enough to supply um, milk for your family or whatever your needs are. So that's kind of dependent on the animal. 
Um, but for the most part, they should be able to do that. Um, and then they had a question on hereditary with the mothering instinct. And they asked if it's the same with war goats. Um, this person has usually has twin or this goat usually has twins and always abandons one. I would say um, I have seen similar things with our goats. We have one that she always has triplets and always abandons one. And so I think it's also their instinct. Um, it is part of their mothering instinct that they know they can only raise so many. Um, so that's what they're going to do. So yes, there's the similar thing in boar goats. Okay. So I'll really quickly go, go over ear tag and notching. Um, obviously this is used as a means of identification. So you know, um, you know what do, doe or you, the um, offspring is identified to. Um, a lot of these methods can depend on the operation. And so, um, and also in sheep, they sometimes will paint the brand on them. So I to again, identify that um, lamb to the dam um, and then tag according to the year. And especially in large flocks, I could see that being very useful because it's easier to identify a number on their back than trying to look at their ear um, especially when there's a lot of them. Um, and then it's pretty typical to tag either with different colors to know the difference between your males and your females just by their tag identification or um, tagging in separate ears. And so um, some like us, we put all of our female tags in the right ear and all the male tags in the left ear. And then we also have separate colors just because that's how it worked out. Um, so just work on, use whatever method works for you. Um, and then different herd um, registries or different breed registries, I guess I should use that, will have different um, letters for each year. And so I think this year it's J for one of our um, breeding associations. So all of our numbers will start with J01, J02. So we all know that Js were born in 2021. Um, and vice versa. So that's another thing if you're using um, or you plan on registering your animals into a breed registration or breed registry, make sure that you tag them according to that registry. Okay, so vaccines, we've had a couple of talks on this before, so feel free to go back to any of the webinars that we've discussed vaccinations. Um, I think we've had two of them over the last year. Um, and those are of course on our YouTube channel, the University of Idaho Extension Livestock channel. Um, but specific to new lambs and kids, of course the different vaccines that you might need is gonna depend on your operation and the types of bacteria that you have present in your operation. Also it's, it's a good idea to sort of take note of what your neighbor's issues are as far as needing vaccines so that you can have a good feel for what you're going to need. But the primary one that we recommend is to give them a CDNT, which will cover your clostridial diseases, your enterotoxemia, and your tetanus. So you want to do that by 10 weeks. Um, you want to do this earlier if your dams are not vaccinated for it prior to lambing or kidding. Um, in particular with this one, um, you wanna protect against that overeating disease, um, which can be pretty um, gnarly if you have it in your system and the clostridial diseases as well. But tetanus is the main one, especially when you're doing any sort of castrating or tail docking. Um, because any sort of open wound is going to be susceptible to a tetanus infection. And you also want to make sure that you're treating with this vaccine when you're making a major diet change. So if you haven't given this vaccine earlier, when you go to weaning or, or switching them over to a creep feed or whatever it might be, which we're going to talk about in a minute, um, you want to make sure that they're protected for these um, especially the overeating with that diet change. If you have pneumonia in your flock, sometimes you can work with your veterinarian to get an intranasal vaccine. 
And then again, if you have issues that pop up in yours or your neighbor's flocks or herds, it's a good idea to just go ahead and vaccinate. Um, and there's dozens of possibilities, so we can't get into each and every one of them. But if there's something happening in your flock and you want to um, reach out to us, we'll have our contact information at the end of this presentation. And we'd be happy to try to help you um, make vaccination decisions. So the, there's a question about if you vaccinate your ewes prior to lambing and you banned the lambs at three days, do you boost CD and T at banding? Um, I do, yes. So my, for example, my ewes, I vaccinate with an eight way prior to lambing. Um, and when I band and castrate tail dock, I will give a CD and T. Um, the recommendation from all of the presentations that we've had so far on this webinar has been that they are most, the vaccinations are most effective in lambs and kids at about a week old. So if you can hold off to that banding and tail docking until six or seven days old, you're gonna have a more effective vaccination. However, if you're going to band in, um, at three days, definitely hit them with a CD and T. Um, but that protection from the dam will cover the first week or two, and then you'll want to give them um, another dose of it. Okay, um, so I'll talk a little bit about castration. Obviously, that's the removal of the testicles on male kids and lambs. Um, most are banded with a Cheerio using an elastrator, which is shown um, there in the bottom of the slide. And this is banding is preferred because it is a you know the least traumatic way to achieve the castration. Um, however, if you are um, castrating them at an older age you usually have to do a surgical removal. Um, and I would recommend using a veterinarian for that. I know people probably know how to do it if they've ever done that with um, young calves or things like that. But there are there is a lot of uh, blood flow to the testicles. So if you are surgically removing them and there is any, um, you know, if you're cutting into those large arteries and veins, that can obviously lead to quite a bit of blood loss. And so it's best done by a veterinarian so that they can um, apply sutures and things like that if they need to. Um, and you should also not be banding using those Cheerio bands in a larger male because um, they can break and not have a full castration, which could cause other complications and infections or not actually castrate them. So they're still intact and able to breed um, so that is not a recommended way of achieving castration in an older um, animal. And so it is recommended if you are going to be castrating using those Cheerios, uh, or I shouldn't call them Cheerios, but those bands, um, to do that between three and six weeks of age. So that, like, like Melinda said, so that they have the vaccine um, in their system, so they aren't at risk of tetanus. Um, but they also need to, the testicles need to be large enough that they are fully um, distended from the body and you can get a good, um, a good application of the band. And so as you can see here in the picture, you want, um, you want that band in the elastrator to be as close to the body cavity as possible of the male um, so that it fully, um, I get, I'm trying to think of the right word, so that it, it's fully um, closing off the testicles from the body because you're just trying to put, the, um, put that band in between the testicles and the body so that the testicles are removed over time as that, elast or as that um, band cuts off the blood flow um, to the testicles and then they obviously fall off and are gone. And so you wanna make sure that you have the testicles in in the band um, and only the testicles. You don't wanna get any other extra skin or anything else that could cause um, an open wound there. And the importance of the, te the tetanus um, vaccination prior to castration 
is that as that testicle is um, kind of, I can't think, dying off is probably the best way, as, as it is dying off, it's also kind of almost desiccating and it can release some um, fluid back up into the body cavity that could cause an infection um, and lead to tetanus. So that's a really important part of castration is applying that vaccination prior to um, applying the band so that they're properly protected from any infection. Okay, Carmen, do you, what is the, the age that you consider too old to be using the, the bands? Um, with boar goats, I would not castrate using a band after eight weeks. I would prefer to do it before six weeks, um, but definitely not after eight weeks. If you're going to do it after eight weeks, I would just call a vet and have a vet do it. Um, in some of the smaller breeds, you could probably wait until they're eight to 10 weeks um, so that those testicles are big enough to kind of be pushed out of the body and have that band have a good clean separation between the body and the testicles. Um, yeah. And I don't, I guess with lambs, it's probably even younger because they grow faster. Yeah. I would say probably in the first couple of months is a reasonable time to be using the bands. Um, beyond that, you would want to go to a more surgical removal, which, um, when they're still under, you know, five or six months old, you probably could do that if you're comfortable. Um, but there does come a time where vets recommend that it's more surgical and pain, uh, pain drugs are used and that type yeah, of thing. Pain so, management. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question about, is it an, an emasculator? Can it be used at the same age range as the elastrator? That's a good question. Um, I have not used an emasculator on a goat, so I don't know. I'll have to look into that. <laughs> yeah, I would say yes within that first month or so is reasonable. Um, so this question is about an older male that we thought was castrated but turned out to have one functioning testicle. How do I prevent this? So it's very important when you're banding that you feel both testicles mm -hmm. outside of the band to start with. There are cases where a testicle can slip back in um, if they're small enough. In that case, most of the time, it's gonna be what we would call a cryptorchid, which can be a, a naturally occurring thing or one that we do with a botched castration. But essentially what that means is one testicle is stuck up in the body cavity. Um, it is not temperature regulated, so it shouldn't be functioning. If the testicle is somehow still outside of the body, I suspect that the castration was not done properly. So I, can't, I guess it, we probably need a little more information on that particular question, but um, certainly it's just really important at the time that you're castrating to take extra care to make sure both of those testicles are in the outside the band. Is it best to wait for all lambs to be delivered before vaccination and banding? We're still waiting on more ewes to deliver. Kind of depends, I think, on your operation and how it works for you and whether you're jug lambing or pasture lambing or whatever the case. Um, usually if you're pasture lambing, you can't catch the lambs after they're two or three days old. <laughs> so you have to be able to bring them in to some place that you can catch them. Um, you can certainly wait if you want to, or you can do them within the first few days if you want to. It's really, to me, it's dependent on your operation and your management style. Carmen, do you have any thoughts on other reasons why you would wait or not wait? Um... No, I do what works for you just as long as you can get a good castration. Um, yeah, I guess that, that's all I have on that one. As far as an age that's too young for castration, if they're up and suckling and doing well, you can castrate 
in the first day if you want to. Just remember that this is a time frame where the testicles have not matured and they're very hard to find. So you have to be pretty comfortable um, finding them at that point. And there are times I usually castrate within the first one and a half to two days um, after they're born. And there are times where I cannot find both testicles and I have to wait for a while. So just keep this in mind when, if you're gonna go that early. Um, so we had a question on when you should tag them. Um, you can tag them at birth if that's what works for you. So anytime. Mm -hmm. Um, this question says thoughts on Burdizo, and to be honest, I do not know what that means. So <laughs> do you have any idea, Carmen? Yeah, it's kind of like an emasculator. Okay. <laughs> and then they had, uh, what do you consider an older age for castration? Um, you can certainly castrate at any age. Um, in older, you know, males that you have used for reproduction, you can still castrate them if you want to keep them as, you know, a pet or a companion goat for some reason. Um, that's still, you can still do that. But if you do that, definitely use a veterinarian because the older they get, the more blood flow they have to the testicles and they would have more risk for um, bleeding out after the removal. Okay. And just a comment here that in the UK, it's illegal to band after seven days. So it's interesting that we have a different time scale. Yeah, I didn't realize that that was the case. And I'm glad you shared that with us because um, it is interesting to hear that. And I guess I'll just answer the Burdizo question. Um, if you are trained in how to use them, certainly use them at your own discretion. It's just not something that I am familiar with. So. Okay, so tail docking is going to be obviously more specific to sheep and why do we do it, especially with the wool breeds. Um, the reason being that when the wool gets kind of long, you can start to observe a manure build, build up at the back end of the animal and it's more um, susceptible to fly strike, which can just cause some issues back there. So especially with your wool breeds, um, tail docking is an important part of raising sheep. However, you don't have to dock hair sheep usually um, because they don't get that same woolly manure buildup. <laughs> so tail docking, um, you can usually do uh, when they're two to three days old. And this is where you find that balancing act um, because you don't want them to get too old because this can be kind of a painful procedure um, the older they get, of course. So, but at the same time, you probably want to do most of your processing all at the same time. So if we're talking two to seven days old in that range, you're probably okay. And there's a lot of ways that you can do tail docking. Um, you want to use a dull knife because that discourages bleeding. Uh, um, if you're going to just cut, do, do that with a dull knife rather than a sharp one. You can also use an emasculator or a gas heated knife. Um, those are all things that work fine on those, but both of these two options, I would recommend um, getting some sort of training on so that you don't cause too much bleeding or open wounds that won't heal. Um, the method that I use and that I feel like is probably pretty recommended is the elastrator with the band, the same as you would do the testicles. Um, this you band and it just slowly cuts off blood flow to the tail. And then over a period of two or three weeks, it just falls off. And the reason that this one is one that I recommend is because when the tail falls off, the wound is pretty much closed and mostly healed. And so you don't have as much risk of, you know, flies or infection or that type of thing. But regardless of the method you use, again, make sure you get that CDNT specifically with the tetanus on board to make sure that they don't get infected. So the length of the tail, this is always an interesting conversation with various people who raise sheep. 
particularly in the 4-H world, you tend to see a lot of really short tail dockings and um, that's, you know, a culture that we've kind of come to just have, I guess, in, in our country. Um, but there's some issues that can be associated with docking a tail too short. One primary one being a rectal prolapse because they just don't have the muscles when you dock that short to hold everything together back there. So my recommendation is I usually try to aim for two or three vertebrae from the base of the tail, or you can look for these caudal folds and you want to be at least at the end of those caudal folds. Um, that will protect all the way down to the, bait, to the bottom of the vulva in a female sheep and it will keep everything where it's supposed to be um, unless they have other reasons for prolapse, which also a hereditary thing. So don't keep animals that have prolapse issues, especially vaginal. Um, but usually rectal prolapse has to do with the shortness of the tail. So um, unless there's some specific reason that you need to have their tail that short, I would recommend a little bit longer. The biggest thing to think about when you're banding a tail or cutting it or whatever you end up doing as the method, you want to go between the vertebrae so you can familiarize yourself with the shapes of the tailbones and find that in-between spot so you're not trying to cut the middle of a bone off or band the middle of a bone. You want to go in between two vertebrae. Uh, this question about whether or not to use two bands compared to one band. When I tail dock, like I said, it's usually within the first two or three days of their life and one band does the trick for tails, no problem. So um, that would be my recommendation. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit on disbudding uh, versus dehorning. So disbudding is the removal of horn buds and young goat kids, young being the primary word there, um, to prevent the horn from growing, whereas dehorning is the removal of larger horns and adult or older goat kids. Um, so to be considered disbudding, it needs to be done in the first two weeks, usually after they're born. Um, so usually that's done using either a hot iron or some type of disbudding paste. Um, if you're using a hot iron, it's important to select the uh, right size appropriate for the animal you'll be disbudding. And so um, the type of disbutter that we use um, and that I would recommend is this electric dehorner um, by Reinhardt Development. And they come in three different sizes, which I think is really helpful if you have um, different size goat kids as well. And so there's a size that's um, recommended for pygmy kids, small kids, and then calves and kids. And um, for us, we have boar goats and Nubians. We use the small kid size because um, it's it's the right size to typically with the dairy goats, we actually wait at least a week after they're born to disbud them so that those horn buds are a little more visible um, and they have a little bit of a stronger um, skull and, and head and skin and everything before we start um, using that high, hot iron. With the boar kids, um, they're pretty much born with their horn buds already there. You don't, they don't need the time for those to start developing like the new like um, dairy kids do. And so they can actually be disbudded usually um, by day three, the first, you know, after day three to about a week old is the best time to disbud them to get a good disbudding without causing um, too much pain for them. And that th there's kind of a sweet spot there because if you wait too long, the horn bud is a lot larger and it's going to take more um, time using the iron on that horn bud to, to appropriately uh, burn the bud off. But if you do it when they're a little bit younger, you don't have to apply as much pressure and for not for as long to get the appropriate removal. Um, disbudding paste can also be used. Um, I would use them with extreme caution because they are pretty caustic because instead of using a hot iron, which you're controlling, um, you know, you're controlling how long it's on there and the pressure that it's being applied at so you don't have to burn it as long. The disbudding paste is usually applied and then it burns um, 
burns off that hornbud for up to six hours, sometimes more. Um, and so if you put that on and then you let them out to nurse, um, that paste that's then on their hornbud will rub onto the belly of the dam if they're nursing and can cause a lot of discomfort um, for that dam because then that, that acid paste that's on their horn um, is now on her stomach and it's very uncomfortable. And I've seen um, a neighbor of ours that used that then their dam started rejecting the kids because they associated that pain with that pain um, with nursing. And so they rejected their kids and that was not a good situation for them. Um, so it's not something that I would use um, unless you really had to and you really didn't want to use um, the burning iron. One thing that we do um, when we burn our horns is then we use this fight back um, spray. It's a cooling and disinfecting. It's actually used for um, uh, kind of like a post dip on dairy animals as well. Um, but we use it on those horn butts because it's cooling. So it kind of takes the, the burning sensation away for them temporarily. And it also prevents any um, infection from growing in those horn buds that have just been burnt off. And I'm not going to go into detail on how to disbud because I think it is something that needs to be done um, in person. And so we're not going to go through it on the webinar in essence of time, but we will try and do um, an in-person training on disbudding uh, sometime in the near future. Um, Carmen, when disbudding Nigerian dwarfs, I will still have a short and sharp horn develop. Why is that? Some of these were done by a vet. Um, sometimes that, that happens because they didn't actually get the full horn bud removed. So when you're disbudding, you kind of um, are getting that horn bud to, so you're cauterizing the area around the horn bud and killing all of the cellular growth into that horn bud. And so if that's not fully burned off, which I have seen done by many different people, um, the horn will still grow. And, and that's where you get scurs and other things like that is just from not actually getting the, the whole entire bud removed. So that's just, a, you know, they, they weren't successful in their actual disbudding. And sometimes you can actually go in later and do a dehorning on animals like that. Um, which is also very traumatic. It, it can be very painful and traumatic for those animals. So that's why if you don't want horns in your herd, it's easier to disbud them when they're young. Uh, this question says, why would we disbud? Is there any specific reason? Yep, that's a great question. Um, different breeds, that is their standard. So a lot of dairy breeds, because they are dairy animals and need to be put into milk parlors and are used, um, you know, our interactions with humans are on a daily basis. Um, they, their breed standards are for no horns, so they have to be disbudded. Um, different, um, just kind of depends on the breed and what they're used for and how, um, how those breeds should be presented for a show or just on your personal preference if you don't want horns um, in, your, in your herd and you prefer to disbud them, that's another reason why. And the standards for showing certain breeds, especially in county fairs and such is changing um, as far as disbudding or not disbudding. So definitely look at your, um, your local show standards to find those rules. Okay, are you using any pain meds while you're disbudding? Some of the codes of practice in Canada are looking like they might start to require it. Yeah, I know that that's kind of a recent topic of discussion in the goat world. Um, we don't because we disbud at home and it takes 30 seconds and then we put that spray on and they go back out to their mom and they're fine. I know if you go to a veterinarian, they usually do have to use lidocaine or another type of pain med on the you know, on the area that they're going to be burning. Um, <laughs> in my personal opinion, sometimes that's more painful, painful than the disbudding itself. Um, so just work with your veterinarian on what, what they are going to do um, if you prefer to have them do the disbudding of your animals instead of doing them yourself. Okay. 
So next, I want to just touch back on some of the biosecurity measures. We've talked about this many times, but I always like to bring it back around because as we all know, when we raise sheep and goats, not only are these critters very susceptible to a lot of different things, but also we are susceptible to most of the things that they can catch as well. So um, when it, whenever it's possible, it's a good idea to try to separate the dams that have not lambda kitted yet, um, dams that have newborns within a week or two old, and then anything older than that. And I know that this isn't always practical in some operations, but the primary reason is that your older lambs have developed an immunity to a lot of the things that would potentially kill a newborn lamb or kid. And so if you were to take those older lambs and kids and take them away, your, your risk of susceptibility in your newborns is much lower. The other thing is that you don't want to have newborns in a pen that recently had older lambs hanging out in there. Um, so just try to um, get your mind around keeping as much uh, biosecurity as you can for these different age of animals. Um, the other thing is, is when it's, whenever it's possible, clean those pens, get rid of any fecal or urine matter, um, provide clean bedding, and uh, you can use lime to sort of disinfect some of the bacteria. You can um, just do a really good job of getting rid of all that stuff, especially when you're in those jugs and barns, because th those critters are brand newborn babies. They're susceptible. And the more fecal matter and urine and all of that can contribute to disease. And anytime that you can just try to stay clean. The other thing is, is your own personal safety as well as the animal safety. Do a good job of remembering to clean and sanitize your boots, um, wash your coveralls, wash your gloves. Um, anytime that you're working with a newborn or a you or doe that is having trouble of some kind. It's possible she's having trouble because of some bacterial infection. So wear latex gloves, change them out, and also work from your least at risk to, sorry, your most at risk to your least at risk. So for example, don't go out and muck around with your older lambs and use that are done lambing and all of those critters that are less susceptible and then move into your newborn barn start in the newborn, feed them, take care of them, and then move out to those animals that are less at risk. And then you're tracking away rather than to uh, your most at risk critters. The other thing that's a good reminder, and I, the reason that I always bring this up is because it's happened to me a couple times. Um, you have a nice clean water tank and everybody's happy. And then the next thing you know, one of the lambs jumped into the water tank and drowned. So keep in mind, different types of things that can happen there that it's really unnecessary and it sucks. It just sucks to find a lamb in the water tank. So um, that's just a, a reminder for all of us. Carmen, are you still there? Yep, I'm here. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about creep feeding. So creep feeding is obviously providing that supplemental feed to transition kids and lambs onto a full ration and off of milk. Um, this can be done using all grain, supplemental grain. And the main thing here is you're increasing their energy and protein intake so that they can achieve um, their full potential for growth so that you can get the most growth out of them um, in that early developmental stages. Um, and kind of also accelerate their weaning so that they're already on that ration um, when you wean them so that the transition off of the milk isn't quite as um, significant when, when they are weaned officially. So you provide the lambs and kids access where the dams cannot access. And so the picture below or on the side here is just a couple examples of that where um, on a, in a pasture setting, they have the creep feeder and then a um, fence with certain panels that only the lambs and kids can crawl through um, to get to that supplemental feed. 
And um, usually if they are less than 50 pounds, that feed to, needs to be providing 18 to 20% crude protein. And then once they hit that 50 pound mark, you can um, drop that down to about 14 to 16% um, crude protein. And I think it's important, um, you can start supplementing them with that creep feed even at um, two weeks old. They may not eat a lot of it, but they at least have access to it. And something that we've also um, done with ours is we give them 24 seven access to that so that they don't come in um, and gorge on the, on the creep feed. They know that they have it at all times. And so they don't have as much risk for um, bloat and other things when they come in and eat too much in one setting. And finally, we'll touch on weaning. Um, obviously this is removing the offspring from their dams. Uh, a lot of times if you don't have any reason to wean specifically at a certain time, sheep and goats do self wean. The offspring often will get big enough and we've all seen it. They run out there and slam into their moms and they're almost the same size and knocking her over. Eventually she gets sick of that and she boots them off. Um, but you can wean at 60 days or to 90 days. And usually the self weaning occurs between that 90 to 120 day mark. The particular thing that you have to focus on is one, what is your target um, for raising those lambs? Do you want lambs and kids, do you want those lambs and kids to be weaned early and get on some um, high energy and high protein feeds so you can get them finished early to sell? Or maybe you have breeding males, you want to make sure that they are not in with your ewes past about five months because at that point they start to become uh, able to breed. And so there's a couple of reasons why weaning can be important, but it's certainly dependent on your management scheme and your operation. Um, and you want to kind of identify the best practice. So for example, if you're weaning and you just want replacement does and ewes, you certainly could leave them out in the pasture and let them grow um, on pasture with their uh, dams and you may not even have to wean them or maybe you wean them and put them in a separate pasture, whatever it looks like for you. Maybe you have uh, lambs and kids that you want to pull off and turn into feeder lambs and get them finished earlier. So these are the times where different types of vaccines are important, different types of feeding regimes. And the biggest thing to remember at weaning and any time that you switch feeds is if it's not a similar feed that they're switching to, it's going to take some change, um, some time to change over. If you switch from like a uh, forage to a um, starchy diet, like you would in a feedlot, um, not only are these animals going to have a lot of stress after, like during their weaning uh, for the first week or so, but they're also at risk of having digestive upset. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong here if you're not careful to switch them over slowly. So my recommendation when weaning would be to not change their diet during that first week of weaning. And then after that stress is gone, they can start to adapt into their new diet over a two to three week period. So you wanna really be careful to change that over slowly, especially like I said, when you're going from a forage base to a feeder lamb diet. Um, again, vaccinating at this time is important, um, especially going into a feed lot situation or a dry lot situation. Um, you want to make sure that they have that um, enterotoxemia, especially the overeating um, vaccine. But there's a number of other things, the clostridials, et cetera, that you may want to vaccinate for. And that's going to be something that you want to work with your veterinarian on. And you also want to, at this time, deworm your animals because at this point, they've had a lot of time with their mothers to catch a parasite load. And this is a good time when you're switching them over catch them, deworm them, vaccinate them, um, move forward. And the biggest thing here is making sure that they have adequate nutrition at the time that they're weaned so that they don't lose ground. Because if you give them something that's not adequate, they're already stressed, even if you're not switching feed, um, you just wanna make sure they have what they need to increase that growth and decrease risk of any sort of disease that they can catch. So here's all of our contact information. Feel free to reach out to us at any time for any question and um, we will take any questions that we have left. 
um, at this okay. point. So we had a couple of questions. Um, another person saying that they have does that are starting to grow those small horn nubs, even though they were uh, done with a hot iron. And yeah, that I've seen that as well. Um, usually that's because they didn't get the full um, horned bud removed during that first disbudding. Um, they mentioned disbudding is so they don't get caught in the fence, which is definitely uh, yes. <laughs> Certainly people that have goats with horns deal with those horns getting caught in the fence all the time. Um, and then they had another comment on that they had lost two kids under sedation in a dehorning. Um, and I have heard of that as well. And that's certainly something to be cautious of if you are going to have your animals disbudded by a vet that's going to put them under sedation um, is there are some risks involved in that. Um, they had another question on, will, you, will they overeat on feed if it is offered for free feeding in those adults and kids? Um, they can, and that's why, especially when you start feeding creep feed, you want to only put a little bit in at a time, but multiple times a day. And so that's what we practice. We put a small amount into the creep feeder um, two to three times a day so that they can't overeat until you know, they have learned to regulate their intake. Um, and that's another reason why the CDT vaccination is so important so that they don't have um, any clostridium kind of production from that overeating. Um, so that's a really good point with the, to always have that vaccine in their system before they get put onto creep feed. Um, and then we had a question on recommendations for getting lambs to start on creep. Melinda, do you have any, um, anything there? So with lambs, um, if you're going to start them on creep pretty early, um, I think the, the biggest thing is the first couple of lambs that you have, show them where it is and they'll start eating it on their own. And if you, if you offer creep early in their life, they're only going to eat as much as they want. You don't usually have too much issue with overeating um, with creep if you do it early enough, because at the point that they start transitioning onto solid feeds usually around two weeks old and they'll transition slowly so at that point you don't have to worry too much about that the main thing is knowing where it is and how to access it but as you know um, if there's any place that lambs can go <laughs> that the moms can't they're gonna um, which that I'll go back this photo that I had on the creep feeding so this one here the reason I'm creep feeding in this pen in particular is there's a little gap in the fence over here that the lambs can get through that the ewes can't. And so this just felt like a pretty easy way to feed these lambs because they're escapees and it worked out good, right? Um, if you're putting them on creep as an older lamb, um, again, it's kind of just making sure they know where it is and creep is pretty palatable. So um, like Carmen mentioned, you just want to do a little at a time. And it's like we talked about with the uh, weaning scenarios, you want to adjust them slowly. So you don't want to put a full amount for them to get in that first few days. You want to transition them where they just don't have access to things um, for, because you're, you're going to end up having them want to eat it in most cases compared to not wanting it at all. So I hope that answered the question. Yep, I think so. Um, so we had a question on what is a good time to start introducing that grain and forage to bottle baby goats? Um, and we do it after the first few days, we'll start putting um, some hay in there for them to nibble on. And then after about two weeks, we'll start giving them grain as well. And then we had a question on selling kids. Um, what is the best way to approach weaning and best timeline? Usually we will wean. Um, so we'll, we'll, we will band and vaccinate and get them started on creep feed and hay. We will then wean between eight and 12 weeks, depending on their, um, if, what they're being sold for, if they're a dairy goat, a boar goat, and their sex, um, which could be a whole other discussion. So I won't go into all that right now. Um, and then we will wean them and then um, within a week have them picked up. So we don't, we try and wean them at home so that they aren't pulled from their mom and then off and somewhere else. We try and give them about a week. Um, to acclimate to bean weaning before then they go to a new place and start on a new diet and a new um, 
everything else just to make their life a little less stressful. Um, and then we had a question about a basic question on how you tell if your doe is pregnant. Um, the simplest way is to take an ultrasound or take a blood sample and have it tested. Um, and then they had a question on um, if you do the CDT vaccination at 10 weeks, then you do an eight way at weaning. Uh, Melinda, how do you, we just do a CDT vaccination, so I'm not sure about the eight. Yeah, so your eight way, um, you'll have to double check because some of the brands do and some don't, but you can get an eight way that has a CDNT. And if you're waiting until 10 weeks to vaccinate the CDNT anyway, I would go ahead and just do an eight way. And then you have to, of course, uh, I think 45 days later, um, give them a booster. So that could coincide pretty well with the question, the way it's proposed. Um, Cause that would be hit them with their first dose at 10 weeks. And then um, about 16 weeks, they're probably almost self weaned by then anyway, but you would hit them again with that booster. So if you're going to do CDNT at 10 weeks, you do have to um, do a booster, but the eight way could serve as that booster, but you're going to have to also do that third shot for the booster of the eight way, if that makes sense, hopefully. Yeah. Um, and then we just had another question. So um, I think Melinda can answer that last question without having to. with a lambing kit list, is that what yeah. we're asking? Um, I believe that that talk was on December 17th. Um, what did we call that one? Just a... I think that was the equipment checklist. Yep, lambing and kitting equipment checklist is what that was. So you can find that on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. Um, from December 17th, but I don't, I don't think I posted it until early January. So you may not, you, I don't know what date would be associated there. Mm -hmm. If mom was given CDNT before lambing and the kid got CDNT at one week, do they need another booster? Yes, they do. Yep. Yep. The, so when the dam receives a vaccine, she can pass some of that in passive immunity through the milk but it is not the same as having its own vaccine. So when the lambs and kids get that vaccine, you wanna make sure you give them a booster as suggested on the label. Okay, and I'll, we'll answer this one last question um, and then we'll end the webinar for today. But if you guys have questions for us, um, certainly email us or put them in the Facebook page and we can talk to you there. Um, and this last question is how much milk should lambs be getting if they're bottle fed? And I will say it depends on their weight. And we have um, some documents that we shared last week, actually, um, to help with that. But we'll also put them in the files in our Facebook page. So you can find them there. Is there anything else, Melinda? Uh, nope, I think we're good. So I appreciate you guys. Or we appreciate you guys for coming on live. Um, watching our webinar and we appreciate everybody who comes on later to watch our webinar as well. If you have any questions, again, reach out to us. 